Hype Man Raj Nation The GOAT GOAT to market From Hype HQ in Chicago, Illinois Startup Hype Man presents The GOAT to Market Show What's up, everyone? I am your host, Raj Nation, the founder and chief pitch artist of Startup Hype Man. This podcast is where we bring you founders, company leaders, and creatives who are building it, who are doing it, who have been there and done that. And they pull back the curtain on their go-to-market strategies so that you can build a venture that you love and become the GOAT of your industry. Want first listen on episodes before anyone else? Subscribe to our newsletter at StartupHypeMan.com. You will get alerts every Sunday morning when we release new episodes. All right, let's hear how today's guest is becoming the GOAT. Ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the microphone from Chicago, Illinois. He is the co-founder of Apologue Liqueurs and Host Cocktails. Please welcome Jordan Tepper. What's up, Raj? Happy to be here. He is Jordan Tepper, like I mentioned, co-founder of Apologue, and we'll get into some of the other sub-brands within that too, like Host And he is kicking off a brand new season here of Startup Hype Man's Goat to Market show. In our second season of the show, we're going to be talking about how to extend your runway. Now, a little bit of background on Apologue and on Jordan himself. Apologue Liqueurs is all about being a forward-thinking cocktail company focused on the intersection of cocktails, community, and culture. Now, as someone who has consumed several Apologue products, Epilogue uh, enforced cocktails, I can tell you, it is definitely hitting on that intersection 100%. Epilogue's been around for seven years. In that time, they have raised over $2.5 million. They've got a team of five full-time employees, 10 part-timers as of this recording, and they're currently doing over a million dollars in sales. So as a CPG company, it's a much different story than building a tech company. And that's what we're going to talk about today is Jordan's experience building this, specifically in how to extend your runway. Now, Jordan, once again, welcome to the show. Thank you for kicking off a brand new season of the GTM show, How to Extend Your Runway. Why is this on your mind? Why is it important to you? Um, I think it's on every CPG entrepreneur's mind these days um, as the environment to to raise capital has gotten more and more challenging. Um, but honestly, it's been something that we've been thinking about from from day one. Um, you mentioned, you know, we've raised two and a half million dollars um, to date, but of that, we still have a over one and a half million dollars in cash. Um, so we've really tried, and that's over the last seven years since we started. And so we've tried to be very conservative uh, about how we spend money and very thoughtful because the truth of the matter is, is there are no true overnight successes in the CPG industry. There's lots of 10 year, 15 year, 20 year overnight successes. And it takes a while to kind of grind to, to get to a good point where you really start to uh, build your revenues, and 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 so we're we're in the early stages of that game, uh, and are are starting to make some good progress. But it's important for us to to have that runway to get that traction to actually start to get those compounding growth effects. We're going to dive a whole lot more into that in a few moments, but first, let's dial it back and learn a little bit more about Jordan the person. Now, Jordan, I'm curious when you were growing up. You know, given today that Apologue is all about the intersection of culture, of community, uh, of cocktails, when you were growing up, like, did you feel a sense of being drawn towards community? Any previous experiences, whether they were professional or just like for fun, that you felt, you know, community was really present in your life? Yeah. So, um, you know, I I grew up uh, both in the city of Chicago as well as two different suburbs of Chicago. Um, I I went to uh, undergrad in, in, in Wisconsin and then moved back to Chicago, uh, went to graduate school in Chicago. Um, and so have just a, a, a very fantastic uh, community of people in Chicago and a very um, 
bullish uh, on the city itself. And so uh, it was important for me when we were starting Apolog um, to embrace the community uh, around us. Uh, I think it's really fulfilling when your company can do well and do good. And I also think it's really good strategy to build uh, momentum in a, in a concentrated geographic area. And Chicago, I think, is a uniquely uh, strong market for that because it's big enough to really support a brand if you do well there. Um, but it's not quite as competitive uh, as some of the coasts. Um, and so the ability to, to really embrace our community, make an impact within the community and build a brand within the community has always been center for us. You mentioned uh, doing your undergrad at Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, you did a graduate uh, degree at the Booth School of Business at University of Chicago. In both of those cases, you were uh, getting a, a degree, or at least partially a degree, in entrepreneurship. So, was the game always entrepreneurship? Um, I was always interested in it. Both my parents were were self employed growing up. Uh, my my father uh, and a partner started a small attorney um, shop, and my mother um, had started a small graphic design shop. And you know they always kind of worked for themselves, and was always the kid with the you know lemonade stand on steroids um, <laughs> trying to sell things. So I knew it was something that I was always interested in. Um, but for me, it was all about kind of continuing to build tools in my toolbox before kind of going off and and doing it. So, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's rare that someone has two parents who both took the self-employed entrepreneurship path. Um, and most people, I would argue, have parents when, they're, when their kid says, oh, I'm going to start my own thing. They're like, what? Are you crazy? You know, like, why would you do that to yourself? Um, can you talk through, you know, seeing your parents take that journey themselves first? You know, like, what did you glean from them? And, and what, what did you observe their as far as their approach to work and building a career um yeah i think number one is, is work ethic um they, they both were extremely hard working uh but at the same time um they were able to make time in their schedule when we needed time when it was important for them to be with us uh, it might mean they worked later at night or got up earlier in the morning or, or worked something on the weekend to make everything work um but they had a little bit of control uh, over their schedule in that way. Um, and the other part of it is just like ingenuity. And this was especially my mom. My mom was just always looking for business opportunities. Like she saw everything as an opportunity is like, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so instilling that mentality in me early on, I think really meant a lot in terms of how I approach things. So let's fast forward a little bit then. What's your, you know, what's your first sort of dabbling or interest in the cocktail experience and cocktails at large? Um, for me, it was really more about the overall category. Like first, I love consumer products because how the consumer behavior decisions behind it, why someone selects a Miller Lite over a course Lite uh, at a bar, uh, why people order what they order, why people seek out what they do has always been really fascinating to me. Um, and then within that, I really like what I call the affordable luxury space. Um, and so these are products uh, that you're you know treating yourself to when you, you purchase, but are still attainable for a, a large proportion of the population. Um, because of that, they tend to be um, higher margin uh, goods. And when you have a higher margin good, you can invest in other aspects of the company and the business, like doing things within the community, because it's not all about price, 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 and kind of a race to the bottom. And so, but it's also not like so elitist that, you know, we're making $50,000 hand watches that only a very small subsegment of the population can. So for me, it was really about finding something in the affordable luxury CPG space. And Spirits just happened to be the, the one that got me excited. My, my partner is really the cocktail guy. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that we connected. Let's kind of educate our listeners now. I gave, a, I gave a very brief background of what Apolog is at the start. 
Can you expand on that and, and let our listeners know really like what, what, what is this company? What is this brand? Yeah. So Applelog started as a maker of all natural liqueurs. Um, for those that aren't familiar, liqueurs are a type of liquor or spirit. Um, they're often used as modifiers in cocktails. Um, some popular examples might be Campari or Aperol or St. Germain. And a lot of the liqueurs that were out in the marketplace um, either used uh, a, bar of, a bunch of artificial uh, ingredients or natural flavors in them, um, or they drew their premium nature from the fact that they were foreign made. They were from French elderflower or from Spain. And so what we wanted to do was bring transparency to the category. Um, spirits, unlike many other categories, don't actually have to list an ingredient statement. And so um, those liqueurs, um, none of them were listing their ingredients uh, in there. And so we wanted to create a line of all natural liqueurs that listed all the ingredients um, that was in the bottle, on the bottle, and allow uh, bartenders and cocktail enthusiasts to elevate classic cocktails uh, like an old fashioned or a margarita by substituting in our all natural liqueurs. So that's how we we started. Let's use that now as the, with that understanding. Let's dive into our main topic today, which is you know kind of hacks on how to how to extend your your runway. I mentioned this briefly in the beginning, you know, CPGs do not operate the same as tech startups and you reinforce that message. Um, and you mentioned, right, you know, there's no real overnight success in CPG. And whereas in a tech startup, like, you know, chat GPT, you know, or open AI, for example, like it kind of was overnight, right? Like they launched and, you know, within what a month or two, they had a million users. Um, or there's many examples of something blowing up on product hunt in the tech world. So I, I say all this to say, I think you've you've got a unique mindset here. So how do you feel as a CPG founder, your mindset diverges from perhaps a tech founder, but then also what are the, some of the similarities that you see? Yeah, sure. So first, it's, it is core to what you're making, the reason why tech can scale faster than, than CPG. Um, no matter what you launch, it's not going to be perfect day one. You're going to need to continue to evolve it and pivot it. With software, you could change a line of code and instantly goes out to all the users that are currently using the software. Uh, with a CPG product, you got to change supply chains. You got to build out the production schedule. You might have to change packaging. You might need to get approvals. It can be a year before you make one small change to your CPG product. So um, as you start a company, no one starts it perfect. No perfect product packaging, product market fit, flavors out of the gate. So it's going to take some time naturally. In addition to that, obviously, you have the uh, ability to actually scale that with a software product. Again, the distribution of it can be almost globally day one, if someone wants to do it and build it that way versus CPG product, you need to get distribution, you need to get it into retail doors. And so your ability to actually scale that takes time, add on all the regulation as it relates with alcohol, and you have even a, a, a longer path. And so it's, it's very important um, to think about your runway in, in longer terms than a traditional tech company. I certainly think there are um, analogs that are maybe more popular in, in the tech uh, world around, you know, just trying things out and iterating on it um, that are important. Um, but but I don't think some of the mentalities around like, um, you know, you just got to like break shit at, and see what <laughs> happens. It, it's a lot harder. Uh, in your case, breaking, to, breaking the bottle actually has a cost to it. <laughs> To, to fix things that way on the CPG side. So you invest more time up front and making sure it's as good as possible, knowing that you're going to need to iterate on it. All right. So let's break down this uh, idea of runway extension into two categories. I would break it down into, into, you know, you can extend your runway by spending less and you can extend your runway by making more. So we start on the, the half of spending less, you know, as we, we've said ad nauseum so far, you have a physical product. Uh, I think in many cases, a CPG brand uh, is really built on, you know, like, like what you have quality of ingredients and then kind of like brand appeal as well, right? There's a certain sophistication element to the Apolog brand. 
uh, which also means you can't necessarily, you know, just say, okay, well, we're just going to cut costs and then cut into product quality as a result. So in, in this side of, of spending less, how are like, what's your access for decision-making knowing that you're trying to save on spend while not cutting into brand appeal or brand quality? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and there's actually, this is the easier answer of the two. Spending less is easier than making more, I think. Um, <laughs> so some things that that we did to spend less. First, you look at what are your biggest spend buckets? Again, we're, we're operating in a relatively high margin category and we're operating on the premium end. So we do not want to cut cost as it relates to the ingredients. We actually invested in higher quality ingredients and higher quality packaging. But those are actually relatively small numbers um, compared to things like salary and rent. So for one, um, for the first five years at Apolog, I worked another full-time job. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was able to not draw a salary for those five years. We've had a number of our team members start part-time. Our production lead actually Monday the fourth was his first day of full-time Apolog uh, as a salary employee after three years of part-time. And so we were able to kind of stretch it out a little bit um, and give them exposure to other things. I'm a huge advocate for you don't need to jump off a cliff and quit your day job day one to start a business. I think there's a lot you can do to extend that runway. The second thing we did, the second biggest expense tends to be rent. What I did was I actually uh, traded uh, my consulting skill set um, to another craft distillery. And so I would help them out one day a week in exchange for us being able to operate and produce our product out of there for free. So for the last seven years, we haven't spent a dime on rent, um, which has also been a very significant way. We have mostly all of our equipment now. We've accumulated that over time, but we didn't take on that big CapEx burden day one. Now that we're starting to grow and have a track record, we're starting, we're looking to open a physical space in Pilsen, but we built up a, uh, uh, a revenue pipeline to be able to grow it. And we're basically busting at the seams of the current facility we've been operating at the last seven years. But now we know we're not going to be starting at square one when we open our new facility. So those were two big items that we were really thoughtful about and spending less. So it sounds like you were actually then any move you were making was a behind the scenes thing that would that would protect the the forward facing brand, not cut into it. Absolutely. As we think about this concept of brand, one of the places where brand really shows up is in how you communicate with customers. And one of those avenues where someone might communicate with customers is through their emails and through their marketing uh, and their marketing automation. And I want to take this moment as we think about the idea of brand to let everyone know that you know, a great way you can put your brand in front of people is through the emails you send. And that means you got to make sure what's happening behind the scenes is working the right way for you, which is why I use active campaign for that. Uh, many of you know that you know, I've been sending emails for a, over a decade now through, through a newsletter system. And for the longest time, I was using MailChimp. Uh, and I finally dropped MailChimp because I was just, I was fed up. Uh, I was dealing with a lot of formatting issues every time, a lot of manual work that could have been more, uh, more automated if the system just worked better. And ultimately, I made the switch and I dropped the chimp to get the goat. And that's active campaign at the end of the day. They are the goat of marketing automation because, you know, whether you are a B2B SaaS, a marketplace, a consumer app, or really anything in between, as I see it, you know, it includes being a CPG. Every kind of business needs a newsletter. Uh, and so you want to make sure that from setup to send, the newsletters that you publish are going to be easy to push out. And in my own personal experience, I think the startup hype man brand has been enhanced since switching to active campaign over the last few months. Publishing has been a 10x easier experience. Uh, and the integrations on the back end are making some of those behind the scenes things so much easier. And again, all of this is to say it helps make the brand that I put in front of people with Startup Hype Man more enhanced, stronger, and really represent you know, what I want it to represent. You don't want your software that you're using to help run the company 
be the thing that cuts into the brand. And with Active Campaign, it's not been cutting in, it's been empowering and it's been enhancing me really every step of the way. So for anyone listening, uh, if you want to check out Active Campaign, if you want to make sure the brand you put in front of other people is the brand that you want represented, check out Active Campaign and you can get a free two week trial by hitting the link in this episode description. You can get a free two week trial of Active Campaign. All you got to do is hit the link in the episode description. Now, Jordan, as we think about this concept of brand a little bit further, I think what's interesting is like, you know, and what we've talked about before, there are other ways you have preserved brand by figuring out sort of the back end of things. Um, can you just talk through like other ways you maybe have pulled off like the bartering aspect and not to not have to like cut into ingredients or not have to like pull back on the design or the appeal of the of the of the the bottle at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so, so the nice thing is we have a, a attractive product that people like. Um, and sometimes it's as explicit as, Hey, we're going to give you product or we're actually going to come to your vet and serve cocktails because that's something that's a, a more desirable asset that people are putting out money from. And our team all has hospitality backgrounds so we could and execute on that. Um, to like less um, uh, overt ways of doing it where we're, we're gifting product um, to, to folks and, you know, they tend to, you know, either charge less um, or um, are, are a better partner for, for us to work with knowing that we're a startup. And I, I think that's okay uh, to be an upfront. A lot of these service providers are invested in your growth whether it's your accounting firm, your attorney, um, they understand where you're starting from. And so if you can take, um, you know, some of that work out of, off their plate, or you can provide their team's holiday gifts for the year, or you can serve for their holiday party, uh, the cocktails, that can be win-win because they're going to spend that money anyway. And this gives them a way to support a client. Um, and it, it really works out for, for everybody. Um, and so really thinking about, you know, ways that you can add value uh, and to those specific people, because it's going to be different for different folks. Well, one great example of that was uh, with Startup Hype Man back in last year in 2023 for Hype Week and for the release of my album, Go to Market. We had the album release party and Apolog was the featured cocktail. You know, we had we had several Apolog cocktails that were being served that night with a bartender. Uh, we even partnered to uh, kind of for the night rebrand uh, one of the Apolog drinks and we called it Hype Juice. And it was the uh, persimmon Negroni um, that we were able to put together. So and for me, right, that was a way, you know, in return, I can give I had Apolog's brand on like every piece of literature and you know digital asset that went out. Um, a lot of people, you know, there was what, 100 people that night, a lot of people got to try out the brand many for the first time ever. I know even like, you know, my mom who was at the event when she hosted her holiday party at the end of the year, she was like, Hey, where was, the, what was the name of that company again? And I told her, and then she went over to Binnie's and, and she went, she picked that up. So, you know, in this case, it was the, it was the gold fashioned um, because, you know, for those who don't, aren't, aren't totally familiar with how this brand works, you know, when you've got pre-mixed cocktails, um, which is part of you know Apple Log's offerings in this case, you know, old fashioned, but they've got martini and a few others as well. Um, when you're hosting a party, if you want to serve good drinks, you don't also don't want to be stuck behind the bar the entire time uh, making those drinks. And you know, for her hosting a party that like I don't know, 50, 60 people are coming to, she was able to just you know pour uh, and serve, which was great. And what do you attract that back to? Throwing you know her experiencing it through. I think what you would call it would be a brand activation just a couple of months prior, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you jump to our, our second product, which is actually another really good example of why it's important to work to extend your runway. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, our, our line of Apple Log liqueurs that were elevating cocktails. So that business was highly, highly 
focused on bars and restaurants. We were going after bartenders who were putting our products into their cocktails, and that's how we were getting sell-through. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, uh, over 85% of our business was bars and restaurants, and they all shut down overnight. And mm. so we had to pivot and evolve. And thankfully, we did have, we were very you know, diligent about how we spent our money. And so we had the capital to be able to invest in uh, a retail product, an e-commerce product, uh, which became host cocktails and started with the gold fashion, which was a, a super premium bottled old fashion that really leaned on our cocktail experience, but started to meet people where they are. And at the time they weren't at bars and restaurants and they were drinking at home, but they were willing to treat themselves. And so if we didn't have that reserve of capital and we had to go try to raise in that environment, um, it would have been very, very challenging to do, but we were able to actually prove it out with the capital we had on hand and then raised on that momentum um, our, our, our most recent round. And, th- and this is interesting, right? So we can we let's let's branch into sort of that second half of the runway extension, which is making more. Um, you're kind of operating, you know, both a B two B business and a B two C. With you know, host cocktails is that sub brand that is retail facing. Apolog as a liqueur is more, you know, more than anything, it's going to be restaurants and bars or your customers there. But can you just kind of walk through like the different brands that? the apolog banner has underneath it and yeah. within that like how are you focused on you know accelerating one versus another yep now some people you know are going to say focus 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 and some people are going to say diversification and and the the truth is you know different things work for different folks uh, as it relates to a, extending our runway uh diversification has been meaningful for us uh currently we have three product brands under our portfolio, Apolog Liqueurs. Thankfully, bars and restaurants have reopened and that business has bounced back nicely. We licensed the trademark for a very popular uh, bar and restaurant in Chicago called Big Star. And we do all of Big Star's canned cocktails. And that is primarily goes into chain retail, Whole Foods, Foxtrot, Dom's, uh, Mariano's, Target. Um, and then we have host cocktails, um, which is 50% e-commerce, which is uniquely high in the in the beverage alcohol industry. And so across those three products, we have nice diversification and, and, and revenue. We really think about Apolog as a cocktail company. And as part of that, we were, you know, selling into these bars and restaurants. We started doing brand representation uh, for import brands, high quality craft spirits that are you know, navigating the U.S. market is very difficult for. So for an all-natural tequila or a mezcal, uh, we represent uh, a Finnish rye whiskey. Um, that We were already going into all these accounts. Uh, we were already teaching them how to make cocktails with our liqueurs, but our liqueurs need base spirits to work with. Um, and so we added on the brand representation piece, which is a high margin um, business for us. Um, and is very complementary to what we already do. So we have three product brands and we have one brand representation arm um, all under Apolog. So that diversification, I, and again, some people might hear that and say, okay, it's not focused. But I think the key here is sort of the umbrella that it's under, which is like you said, you are a cocktail company. The story it reminds me of is um, years back, this would have been, I don't know when the quote was, but um, the uh, Reed Hastings, co-founder of Netflix, said, like, there's a reason we didn't call it like video. I, I'm butchering the quote here, but he, he said something to the effect of like, uh, we intentionally didn't call it like video on demand or we intentionally didn't call it like uh, DVD by mail. That's what he said. We intentionally didn't call it DVD by mail because we knew that would lock us into one format that potentially could be outdated. You know, no one could see the future then, but you know, he was like, it could potentially be outdated very quickly. And if we ever wanted to branch into anything else, you know, we would only be looked at as DVD by mail. That's why the brand was named Netflix from day one. And what that allowed them to become was a media company at the end of the day, right? Starting with delivering DVDs by mail, but then branching into streaming other people's content and then streaming original content. And then now they're doing all those things plus streaming live content as well. 
and now they're doing like live sports uh, and, and, and things of that nature. So that starts with understanding your identity, I think, at the end of the day. And, and if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, like you're creating these, these product lines based off of the identity you have as a company, not based off of the product, quote unquote, that you're selling. Absolutely. And that was a, actually like an unlock for us being a cocktail company. There's a lot of big and small beer companies. There's a lot of big and small wine companies. There's a lot of big and small spirit companies. Um, by being a cocktail company, we felt that was specific enough to what our DNA was, but still gave us different avenues for growth. And so that's been a really helpful North Star for us as we think about our company. As we think about what kind of company it is that you are building, I want to turn to our listeners for a moment and turn that as you think about if you are building a more tech forward company, how are you looking at the identity of your company through the lens of the, the product itself? And how does that product represent the overall identity of the company and not necessarily box you in? You got to make sure the software represents the brand the right way. And that means you need to have the right partner. Well, We've got the right partner for you. Their names are Akeva. And guess what? They are the goat of software development. Here is the reality. I have seen too many startups get screwed over by offshore or budget dev shops. Uh, those providers tend to be order takers and they do the bare minimum, which often means software with glaring holes or they're forced to pay hidden release fees in order to claim ownership of their code. And these are real stories I've heard from founders. And then there's a Kava who doesn't do any of that to you. They actually build strategically for scale from day one. They help you make product decisions and they give you full ownership of your code by default. And all of these things help you essentially allow your product to live up to the brand, not force your brand to conform down to the product. Akeva has a killer offer for you. They call it a You Call It Code Review or a YCCR. What is that? Well, for those who qualify, Akeva will review the most critical parts of your code so you can see exactly what your tech needs to launch or scale. And they'll do this completely free. And then you call it from there. So do you want to handle things on your own? You call it. Want to get Akeva's dev help? You call it. You want to take it somewhere else to a different shop? You call it. It's like, remember back in college, you'd have those, those nights going out where it was like the you call it well shots at the bar, but this is actually a premium experience. You call it and you get it for your product that you're building. So if you're ready for a you call it code review and ready to see if you qualify, if you're ready to get goaded, head to akava.io. That's A-K-A-V-A dot I-O, akava I-O. Tell them Startup Hype Man sent you. Today on the season premiere of the Goat to Market Show, we've got Jordan Tepper, the co-founder of Apolog. We're talking about hacks to extend your runway. Now, Jordan, I wanted to ask you this, you know, coming off that, that sort of that, that mini talk there about software, revenue tends to be the metric of choice in a software startup. Um, is it the same running a CPG brand, running a cocktail company, or are you focused in a different area? Um, the number one thing we focus on is what they call depletions. Um, how alcohol works is it's a three-tier system. You're a manufacturer who sells to a distributor, who sells to a retailer, which includes bars and restaurants, but also you know liquor stores. Um, we cannot sell directly to consumers. We cannot sell directly to retailers. We have to sell to distributors. Um, and so our revenue is when we sell to a distributor. Our depletion is when our distributor sells to a retailer. And that is more important to me than our revenue because our depletions are going to drive future revenue. If our depletions aren't growing, um, our, our, our revenue is not going to grow. And so if we have a great revenue quarter, but a crappy depletion quarter, well, the next quarter is going to be tough on the revenue side. Um, now that we've started to do more e-commerce, we do have the ability um, to, to know when consumers are buying. It's still going through all those tiers of distribution, uh, which is crazy and inefficient and a topic for another day. Um, <laughs> but we at least can see when consumers are buying from our website. And so now that's also all those 
um, you know, more popular DTC type metrics are things that we are starting to measure and look to grow average back sit size, reorder rate, lifetime value um, are, are important now that we actually can see who's ordering our product where traditionally in alcohol, you have very little visibility into the end customer. Earlier, when I did your introduction, I mentioned that in seven years, Apolog has five full-time employees, 10 part-time. I would actually look at this as another sort of area where you could you could look at it as spending less or you could look at it as making more depending on the, you know, the hires you're making. How do you strategically look at, you know, for, for many companies, seven years in the game, they'd have 100 plus employees by now, if not more than that. But again, I think you've been really strategic about how and when you hire. So can you talk through when you realize we need to add a person and then also where you see, oh, we're going to add here versus here. Yeah. Um, I'm a very big believer in like date before you get married. Uh, I do think our um, work economy has evolved uh, quite a be- bit, especially in the last five to 10 years where it's more common, where people are taking, you know, multiple part-time positions and have multiple interests um, uh, and that sometimes they actually can be a better fit for a while on a part-time basis. Um, Ultimately, um, uh, I think every single person that we have worked with at Apolog have started in some capacity, either as a consultant or on a part-time basis. Um, And a decent amount of people actually started on the production side of the business. So really actually learning how to make the product um, and getting experience with that. And I think it's, you know, common quote, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Uh, Culture, I do think is, is super important. And the faster you grow, the harder it is to maintain a consistent culture. I have a lot of admiration for some of those tech companies that have grown really fast and maintained a strong culture. Um, But it's certainly easier to build that culture over time as you slowly add people. And so for us, um, as exciting as it might be to be able to get someone full-time who can do this, sometimes it looks really shiny on the outside. And once they actually get into the the business and the culture, it might not be as strong of a fit. So I rather test that out, prove that out, make sure that it's a long fit, and then bring that person on, knowing that we won't grow as fast as we could have, but I actually think it's healthier growth. On that note of culture, earlier you had said how you know everyone on your team has a background in hospitality. Do you see that as almost like a prerequisite to being able to do the, do any of the jobs under your brand effectively? We haven't made it an explicit prerequisite, but I will say it is a common thread and something I see a lot of value in. Um, One thing that is a prerequisite and one of our uh, core values is being solution oriented. And people in the hospitality industry naturally need to be get trained to be solution oriented. They are constantly dealing uh, with problems and and how to fix them. And so I found that they can be excellent team members. They also seem to have a passion outside of it, whether that's photography or social media Mm -hmm. or um, making stuff and, and being able to like tap into what we call those superpowers for what they're interested in otherwise and let them kind of scratch that itch has also been a way for us to more efficiently grow what we're able to do as a team. Well, a good example of that would be uh, your brand manager, Damien, who that's how we got introduced in the first place. Uh, Damien's an artist. He's also obsessed with plants. Uh, And those, I think the fact that he likes those things, uh, I would say like the the proxy of that or or like the, the byproduct of that is the fact that he has an interesting life ma- makes whatever I see he does with Apolog like that much more interesting as a result. It's not like dry personality has no interest. Their only interest is work. So then whenever they're talking about work, it just seems like it's work versus with someone like him. It is like, I don't know, this guy, I mean, his Instagram is at not a plant shop because he has so many plants and he loves them so much. Right. So when I see he's having fun there, when I see like, you know, new artwork he's working on, and I also see the stuff he's doing with Apolog, it it just seems to make sense that it's like it's lifestyle for for someone like him, not so much just like going to work, if you will. And I think that ultimately that increases the brand presence. Yeah. Another good example for Damien is with our host cocktails, we evolved the packaging to be much more 
artist driven. And we didn't do that because Damien was an artist and he didn't do the artwork uh, on the packaging. But when it came time to sourcing new artists for additional SKUs, guess who knew a bunch of really talented artists in the different <laughs> mediums that we were looking to Damien did. And so we were able to get to really quality people at what I would call, you know, friend pricing um, that allows us to execute on something really, really well at a much more affordable rate than if we were Diageo and just spending money to spend money. Yeah. And, and as someone who has consumed the product several times uh, for those who haven't seen it before, like it's, the unboxing itself is its own experience, almost the way like kind of Apple has figured out how to like unbox the iPhone, uh, where it intentionally like, you know, the lid opens slowly. Um, the host cocktails uh, that come underneath the Apple Log brand, it's a like, like, like Jordan said, it's an artistic box. You open it, you know, it's like this full sort of like almost like it's like a Christmas, you know, Christmas morning kind of experience. There's this little like bottle of spritz that's called an atomizer. That's, you know, you're spraying a perfume scent over the top of your drink. You know, you, you take that out first and then this big bottle comes out from underneath and the bottle itself. I mean, I think it would be easy to just like do the lowest grade of glass possible and like a, a poor shaped bottle. Um, but the bottle itself is also contoured in a certain way with a little bit of texture on it that makes it in experience in and of itself. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's a great unboxing experience. We spent a lot of time. Working <laughs> on. All right. We need to hit our wrap up Jordan. Um, let's start here. Where can our listeners find, where can our listeners find you and where can they learn more? Um, sure. For, for finding me personally, the, the only social media channel I use is, is LinkedIn. Um, I, I, tell my wife it's cheaper than a therapist and I'll, I'll put some some things out there which has uh, <laughs> been a fun and, and good community uh, for our brands more importantly though uh, host cocktails host is h-o-s-t-e and then cocktails so at host cocktails on instagram um, and then apolog liqueurs apolog is a-p-o-l-o-g-u-e um, for those thinking about naming a company name a company that's easy to spell and easy to pronounce <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been, we've been working on that, but we do love Apple Log, uh, and check out Apple Log, of course, uh, dot com or Apple Log, of course, on Instagram. All right, Jordan, who is one person you want to give a shout out to who has been helpful for you on your journey? It's a good question. There, there's been like no joke, an army of people who've been really, really helpful. Uh, one that sticks out to me is uh, a former manager, uh, Brian Ellis, uh, who I worked with. The big thing with Brian was we did weekly feedback sessions um, and just constantly uh, a, a great forcing mechanism to get positive feedback. What am I doing well? What should I do more of? And constructive feedback. What can I change? And being very tactical about it. That culture of feedback and setting that working style from day one has been the single most impactful thing for me that I've taken to my other jobs and to Apple Log is anytime we're bringing someone on, we're doing regular feedback, both them giving me feedback and me giving them feedback so we can both continue to grow. And I think it's super hard to put that culture in at a later date once there are problems. But if you have that space for feedback on a regular basis, it gets ahead of a lot of things. We'll now give our top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners based on the discussion today. I'll go first and I'll turn it over to you. The topic today was hacks to extend your runway. We really, uh, I mean, I'm going to drive this point home. The, the big lesson I have here is in the pursuit of extending your runway, do not sacrifice your brand. In the pursuit of extending your runway, do not sacrifice your brand. Jordan, top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners. That's a great one. I, I would also add, you know, to, to start a company, especially a CPG company, uh, you do not need to quit your day job day one. Um, uh, there's lots of famous examples, Spanx, Nike, where the founders worked multiple jobs, Warby Parker, uh, until they were able to get to the point where they could pay themselves uh, a salary. Um, and I think that that is the, the wrong mentality of, you know, you just got to 
jump. Uh, I don't actually think that that's the the best mentality. Um, and then the other one I say is like you, everybody who's a founder has unique skills um and they might not all be applicable to the business so if you can trade some of those skills um in return for someone else who values those skills but has different skills than you whether that's legal work um or accounting work or production or customer like do it everyone wins and you're able to extend your runway my final question which is how we end every episode on this show. Fill in the blank, Jordan. Entrepreneurship is blank. Entrepreneurship is a journey. Entrepreneurship is a journey. He is Jordan Tepper, the co-founder of Apolog. Now, listeners, as you were hearing this interview, did you have anything that came up in your head that you're like, ooh, I want to ask this follow-up question to Jordan? But obviously, you're on your own side of the speaker, and you can't ask him that as you're listening to this. But we've got an opportunity for you. Join the after party. This whole first week that this episode is live, Jordan's hopping into Goat to Market Club and doing an Ask Me Anything. You can pop in there, ask him a question. He'll answer it for you. It's a great way to take what you've learned today and double down on it, expand on it, or go even further in a direction that maybe we weren't able to during this interview. Joining Goat to Market Club is free. You just have to go to startuphypeman.com slash GTM dash club. Startuphypeman.com slash GTM dash club. You can hop in there for the Ask Me Anything, plus all the other good stuff we've got going on inside of Goat to Market Club. Once again, thank you to Jordan Tapper for joining us on the season premiere of the Goat to Market Show. We'll catch you next week. That'll put a bow on this one. Before we head out of here, a couple quick housekeeping items. Number one, did you like what you heard? Well, give us a subscribe and a follow. Maybe share it with one friend who you think would find this valuable. Number two, remember that Ask Me Anything I told you about at the end of the episode? That goes down exclusively inside of Goat to Market Club, our online founder and startup community. And you can access it for free. Your membership is 100% free at startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club number three need pitch help startup hype man is your man whether it's a fundraising narrative or a go-to-market or category narrative we've got you covered to make sure you have messaging that doesn't help you just go to market but of course what helps you become the goat to market all right we will see you next week here on the goat to market show thank you for listening and remember why be a unicorn when you can be the goat